Today's scripture is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. My friends, you asked me about spiritual gifts. I want you to remember that before you became followers of the Lord, you were led in all the wrong ways by idols that cannot even talk. Now I want you to know that if you are led by God's Spirit, you will say that Jesus is Lord, and you will never curse Jesus. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but they all come from the same Spirit. There are different ways to serve the same Lord, and we can each do different things. If the same God works in all of us and helps us in everything we do. The Spirit has given each of us a special way of serving others. Some of us can speak with wisdom, while others can speak with knowledge. These gifts come from the same Spirit. To others, the Spirit has given great faith, or the power to heal the sick, ten, or the power to work mighty miracles. Some of us are prophets, some of us, re and some of us recognize when God's Spirit is present. Others can speak different kinds of languages, and still others can tell what these languages mean. It is the Spirit who does all this and decides which gifts to give to each of us. I think she's going to be up here someday doing other things. <laughs> some of you uh, may know this and some of you may not, but Alexa and I have written a children's book together. Um, I wrote the book, and she illustrated the whole thing, and I'm happy to say it is at the publishers right now. <laughs> she was my inspiration, so we are delighted. This is Human Relations Sunday. Uh, it's a day that's been set aside, designated for remembering the importance of how we interact with and support each other and others especially those who are marginalized or who are struggling with difficult circumstances in their lives. Human Relations Sunday falls on the Sunday right near Martin Luther King Jr. Day and brings us a reminder of how we are called to be the church, to follow Jesus' call for us, to use our God-given gifts to bring God's love into the world. In Paul's letter to the church in Corinth that Alexa just read this section, he reminded them that they had all been given a variety of gifts. Gifts that were intended to be shared in the community, with the community, and in ministry to the whole world. Ultimately, this day is about acceptance, advocacy, and seeking justice in our world. And it's nothing new. The Bible is full of stories. If you read the, the Bible, the different stories in the Bible, it's full of stories about ways in which people seek justice, where God seeks justice for those who have been ignored or marginalized. All we have to do is look at the ministry of Jesus to realize that. So I have an illustration. Take the stories of the daughters of Zelophehad. Anybody know that story? <laughs> it's from the book of Numbers, chapter 27. And I'd like to share a reflection by the Reverend Talitha Arnold, who wrote a, a devotional on this, and, and her point is well taken. I thought she said it way better than I would. So she writes, The Lord said to Moses, The daughters of Zelophehad are right in what they are saying. You shall indeed let them possess an inheritance among their father's brothers and pass the inheritance of their father on to them. So who do you know who needs this story of the daughters of Zelophehad? The story is the story of five young women who because of the inheritance laws that disinherited daughters, everything would go to the sons or to the brothers of the, for the man who died, faced destitution after their father's death. Their story was one of courage, desperation, or some combination of both. And it motivated them to go to the tent of the meeting to make their case to Moses, the great Moses, the high priest Eleazar, the elders and the whole assembly, they stood in front of all of them. Moses, surprisingly, did not dismiss the young women, but instead brought their case to the Lord. The Lord proclaimed that the daughters were right and changed the law. Who needs to know this story? Perhaps it's the person 
struggling to recognize their sexuality with the teachings of the faith they've trusted since childhood. Perhaps it's the mid-career woman who has hit the glass ceiling in the culture in her workplace. Maybe it's a parent trying to figure out what's best for their child and what works like male, female, trans, mean, what does all that mean in a gender fluid world? Going beyond gender issues, maybe the story is about a God who gives heed to the disenfranchised daughters and giving hope and courage to someone who's been dismissed or passed over because of the color of their skin, their ethnicity, their economic status, or their accent. Who needs this story, she says. Perhaps it's anyone who yearns to know there is more light and truth that breaks forth from God's word and God's way. So for the daughters of Zelophehad, justice prevailed, despite the laws that prohibited them from inheriting their father's estate. God saw the need and affirmed that they, indeed, should receive it, despite the fact that they were not supposed to as females. When we work together with others in the United Methodist Church and the greater church on earth, we can bring about justice. Not by ourselves, we don't do it alone, but we participate in it together and with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We don't do this perfectly. It'd be nice if we could, but we don't. And there's, there's always room for improvement. But when we use our God-given gifts, we can be the church. I've said before, we aren't the church, we aren't representing the church in the world. We are the church in the world. We're in this together. When one hurts, we all hurt. When we join together and focus on helping others, not just ourselves, we're following Jesus' command to love one another, to serve one another, and to advocate for one another as the church of Jesus Christ in the world. It's not just about us. It's about our brothers and sisters everywhere who are struggling with addiction, poverty, homelessness, prejudice, and so many other things that drag them down and marginalize them. The gifts of knowledge, wisdom, prophecy, miracles, healing, discernment, speaking out and interpretation are some of the gifts that Paul explained to the Corinthian church. What gifts do we have that make a difference to others? How do we use our gifts to the glory of God and in following our commission to love in the way Jesus loves and asks us to love? That agape love, that word, that Greek word agape, it means kindness, compassion, self-giving, wholeness, and generosity. It's so much bigger than just that translated love word, not that love isn't part of it. But maybe we don't think we can make a difference. I don't know. I've heard people say, well, I can't do anything. Maybe we're under the impression that in order to do something for God, it has to be this huge, magnificent, large act of social justice. Or maybe we have no idea what gifts God has given us. But we, when we think about it, what we do doesn't really have to be anything spectacular. It might be a simple act of kindness, something that we do to reach beyond ourselves, such as offering to pray for someone, or making a phone call, or making donations of food, clothing, money to reputable organizations who offer services to those who are in need. It might be volunteering in some way, or it might even be something we didn't think was anything special, but it made a difference in someone's life. We live our faith. An example is from Norm Toms, who's the director of our Camp Michuana up in Maine. I know you think about, don't think about that one so much, but um, he writes for he writes one of the devotions for the online uh, daily that comes from our annual conference. And he recently wrote this reflection and a prayer for the daily posting. And he writes this: We have had a tradition at our youth rallies that I know dates back to the 1970s. That was a long time ago. <laughs> But I have a feeling it may, it may even be before that, he said. On Saturday nights, we have a worship service at midnight, which is way past my bedtime, but they <laughs> kids do it, they stay up later. The service is very loosely organized and the leaders may play a song or read a scripture. But then we begin, I love this, we begin our popcorn prayer. With only a, the Christ candle lit, anyone anywhere in the circle can speak. For in it is some form of prayer. For some, it is telling the group what they have been dealing with. Many times, 
many times this time can last as long as an hour. As many of these circles as I have sat, on, sat in, I'm always amazed at the depth of sharing. He goes on, but I did not realize the true power of this circle until I talked with a young adult who told me at a time, about a time when she was in college. She told me she had become so depressed that she was really scared she might never feel well again. She was struggling with every aspect of her life. I kept trying to pray, she said, but I just could not start. I would open my mouth and nothing. I would try to silently say something in my mind, nothing. Then on December 4th at midnight, I realized at that moment there was a circle of people sitting by the light of a single candle, the Christ candle, on the floor of a dining room of my camp half a country away. It was a popcorn prayer time. I closed my eyes and began to speak, knowing that just like that circle that I used to sit in, there would be no judgment, no making light of, no acceptance, only acceptance and love. And I closed my eyes and asked for help. She said, the next day I found the courage to walk into my college's health services, and I did indeed get help. I am not saying it has been an easy thing to do, but today I am in a much better place. And she told Norm, all I had to do was remember popcorn prayer time. And he goes on, the power of the Holy Spirit is an unstoppable force. Perhaps the most important thing we can do is to provide circles of acceptance and love, and of course, popcorn time. <laughs> prayer makes a difference. Prayer is a gift from God. Prayer is something we all can do. Even if we don't have the words, we can lift up the person's name or situation. God knows, and that prayer can be lift up many other prayers that make a difference. This congregation has had many, many opportunities to pray for others. It seems like it gets bigger and bigger all the time, which is a compliment to us because people know we pray for them. And both, these are both prayers of concern and joy. So I'm getting a few more emails saying, you know, I want to share this joy. I think we need to lift prayers of praise. And, and we can't forget the joys. It's good to think about what spiritual gifts we have and how we share them. And it's also good to remember that we are brought together by the Spirit to be in community so we can achieve the common good. It means working in harmony together using the gifts that we each have received. The Spirit doesn't give everyone the same gifts because one person couldn't do everything, although we have a few folks in the church who do an awful lot. We aren't expected to do all, all of us to do the same thing. It isn't about being cookie-cutter Christians so we all look the same. It's about being the whole body with different gifts, different parts that come together to make a whole. We are the body of Christ made of faces, ethnic groups, colors, genders, ages, lifestyles, and capabilities. Our goal as followers of Jesus is to serve him in this world and to care for others. And that includes those in our congregation and our communities as well as in our nation and our world. We use our gifts to keep growing in the likeness of Christ by offering hope and love to others. There are so many ways that we can touch the lives of others. When my dad was in a senior care center called Friendship Village in our hometown, he seemed the happiest when he could sit at his computer. I mean, he taught himself computer at 80, age 80, and he kept going up until he was 97 when he died. But he would sit at his computer and play games and do research or order things through the mail. That wasn't always the best thing. <laughs> he didn't really get into the social activities that they offered, although he did love it. You, you may guess this, when it was time to eat. You loved going to, the, to eat. And, you know, I, I don't think Dad ever disliked any food. I've never, I never saw him say no, to, and it could be the worst food, and he would eat it and say it was good. <laughs> he just liked to eat. He did have some favorites, though. One summer day, one of the churches in our hometown brought a van load of people and pies to Friendship Village. And some of the folks had spent the day before making pies and make, made arrangements for the res residents to be outside and to have a dessert, a pie festival, so they could each enjoy a piece of pie. 
And on the list of pies was sour cream raisin, which I've never eaten myself, but it's in the Midwest, it's kind of a popular thing. Apple, blueberry, cherry, and a variety of others. And I knew Dad liked sour cream raisin, so I was teasing him when we were Skyping that Sunday night afterwards, and I said, I bet I know what you ate, sour cream raisin. He said, yes, and I also had apple. <laughs> The gift of pies from the church folks made his day and the day of the residents who were there. It brightened their lives. It's such a small thing. And the gift of love and generosity was what went with it and made it even more special. Several years ago in April of 2019, before the pandemic, uh, the Sillenpa children and Ariel and I went to Wentworth Senior Living here in Portsmouth to give Easter cards that the kids had made in Sunday school. And we went over there to give them to folks who were there that we knew who came to the services that I did there. And we gave out quite a few, I think it was over a dozen. Um, but the children had made them and we thought, well, let's share them with this group. And the first picture is of Barbara Sylvester, who, as some of you know, painted the Noah's Ark painting that was on the wall up here, but now is down on the wall as you go into the Sunday school. So if you look at the last page, uh, her picture, their pictures are there. Um, yeah, you didn't have it yet, Alexa. But Bar they, there were pictures. So Ariel and I split the kids into two groups and three of us, three went with me and three went with her and we distributed the, the pages, so or the, the cards. So Barbara was just delighted. I don't know if if any of you have ever met Barbara, but her face lit up when she saw those kids and she was so happy. And so um, they just, they, they, all the residents that got the cards were so appreciative. It, the fact that somebody cared, it made a difference to them. It was a small act of kindness and the kids had fun doing it, not only drawing and making the cards, but also those who went with me and with Ariel were able to hand them out. Those are just two examples of a small act of kindness that took place that made a difference and it wasn't anything that we might think is spectacular or outstanding, but it made a difference. For dad, it wasn't so much the pies, although dad might disagree with me, but, or the Sunday school class making the cards, although they made them with love. More than that, it was the interaction with the folks who received them. Of course, now we have restrictions, so we can't really do the same, same way, things the same way, but we could still make a difference. We could still make cards and send them out to folks in nursing homes or who are uh, alone or who are isolated, um, who can't get out. Or we can speak out when we hear an injustice or be part of helping to work to restore that and bring justice or reach beyond ourselves to connect with others near and far in some way or another. It's about recognizing that we're all part of God's family no matter where we live, work, or play, no matter what color our skin is, what our sexual orientation is, what age we are, what our physical abilities are, what, our, what gender we are, or any other number of circumstances that surround us. It's about following God's guidance. It's about living God's vision for us. We learn from each other and we can learn from our children. There's a project called the Global Community Project, which has been around a long time. Children around the world share their poems, wishes, and connect with each other even though they live thousands of miles away from each other. And a while ago, there was an exchange online with children who had written poems based on Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech, I Have a Dream. And many of the children in the United States, particularly in this one school in Maryland, interacted with uh, fifth and sixth graders their own age in other parts of the world. Some were in Taiwan and some were in Israel and, and there were all, a number of other countries. And so I picked a few of the writings from those fifth and sixth graders who were part of that exchange and where they wrote what their dreams for the world are. And each one has the title, I Have a Dream. I have a dream, this is from Ebony, sixth grader. I have a dream that everyone can believe in themselves. I have a dream that we will all be accepted equal. Just because of our color doesn't mean we aren't all God's children. 
I have a dream there will be no more drugs on this earth and that no one will see any more drugs in this world. I have a dream that no one will make fun of each other just because they are slow, dumb, or handicapped. I have a dream that one day everyone will love each other no matter what they look like. And from Trey, a fifth grader, I have a dream that all people will be treated equally. I have a dream that people would lay down their differences and be friends. I have a dream that people will respect themselves and others. I have a dream hunger will end and peace will begin. I have a dream that my dreams will become your dreams too. I have a dream. And from Jason, a sixth grader, I have a dream that people would stop hating each other. I have a dream that world hunger would end. I have a dream that there is world peace. I have a dream that money won't take over the world. I have a dream that pollution will end. I have a dream that sickness will end. I have a dream that people will be equal. I have a dream people will respect me for who I am. I have a dream that everybody would have this dream. And Chris, grade six. I have a dream that one day the sun will rise to a better world. I have a dream that one day world peace would be the main headline of every newspaper in the world. I have a dream that one day people would start using what nature gave us. I have a dream that your dreams and my dreams will come true. As a church in our community, we are united with churches all over the world and we can use our gifts to find ways to make a difference, to make the dreams of children and adults become a reality in the ways we reach out to interact and care for them, for our world, for others, in whatever ways we can, with whatever abilities we have. Faith isn't something we do for ourselves, it's a verb. Faith without action is static. And if we fail to use the gifts God has given us to be the church in the world, we then are not following what God has asked us to do. Our purpose as followers of Jesus is to send each other into the world, to share the love of God with others, to accept others, to help them where, they, where we can, to walk with them as they take their journey, and to share the unconditional love of God with them, agape love. And we don't do it alone. We have been given a community of faith here and throughout the world, but, and we are all part of building that kingdom of God on earth, regardless of where we are located. What can we do? Can we pray? Let's pray. Can we listen to others? Let's listen. Can we bring a healing presence to someone? Let's be there. Can we speak out for injustices? Let's speak out. Can we share the love of God with family, friends, and acquaintances? Let's share. Let's be the church. Let's keep living out our calling to recognize, welcome, and support the children of God, wherever they are, whoever they are. We are the church. Together with each other and others, we are led and guided by the Holy Spirit. Let us continue to grow together. Amen. I forgot the uh, music for the song that I was going to sing, but there is a very short version of it in the In the Faith We Sing um, book. So um, listen intently because it's going to happen really fast. <laughs> twice. People, people need the Lord.
But what if we could love the way Jesus did? Passionately, faithfully, powerfully. What if the way we love could make a difference in the world around us? What if that love looked at everyone the way God does? A love which doesn't see the past, but is consumed by a desire to see people come to know Jesus. A love which is patient and kind, not envious or prideful. A love which puts others before ourselves, chooses peace over anger. A love which protects, trusts, hopes, perseveres. Do we love like this? Do we love like Jesus? Maybe it's time to ask a simple question. How can we love better?